everybody, welcome to Hanging With Bears, episode 575. Uh, give us one sec, I'm just trying to work out how to send a link. So one second for anyone watching. We've got two acre, Otto, Kim, uh, and one other, so I don't know who the other is, <laughs> so apologies. Uh, Sage, welcome, welcome, welcome all. Uh, so yeah, two acre, your first in today, congratulations. Congratulations. Um, as usual, you win absolutely nothing except for my, I wouldn't say love, just, just like, you know, I just like it a bit more. Uh, yes, yeah, so we've got Gardner coming on today, so it should be fun. So if anyone's got any questions, as usual, stick them in the question mark bubble thing. Um, I've got a couple of questions already sent in from Ukrainian, so I'm going to try and work through them. Um, if and when I can. Um, what's up, Otto? You saying it's too quiet? I was one sec. I don't. I don't know how to change my volume. Here. Give us. One. Is that better? All right. Give us one sec. Can we just send the thing again to Gardner? You said send him a link when he's when we started off. Uh, yes, yeah, so I hope you've had good weeks, everybody. Um, apologies for the COD stream on Monday. That was. I'm blaming COD for that. I, I am. Um, it was a, a, a misunderstanding of dates and stuff, but I'm, I'm definitely blaming COD for it. Obviously, we won't say that publicly, but privately, he kind of like said it was his fault too. Uh, so Berserker, yeah, also saying there's an audio issue. Is anyone else struggling with it, or is it just South African people? But yeah, uh, in short, I thought the festival was this weekend. I've, I've been all over the place this week. I have no idea, like, what date it is. So I thought, because this weekend in England is like a bank holiday Monday, so it's like a long weekend, so Monday's off. Um so i assumed that it was the same in america and that's why you were having your festival so i just thought it was this week so i planned a pre-festival idea or I, I suggested it um and in the group you've got finks wobbly and joe who are all going to the festival wobbly is getting married there finks is marrying her um but yet no one told me that it wasn't this week and somehow i get the blame so uh, right, Mr. Gardner, I see you. Give us one sec. I shall invite you on. Okay, invite sent. Uh, yeah, so I'm blaming the other three members who are going to the festival for not telling me where it was. Hello, sir. How you doing? You okay. So this is um this is your first Instagram stream then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just getting used to all the mechanics of doing this with the phone. I've been doing it for a couple of years, and I've st I still don't know what all the buttons do. And there's, there's like <laughs> four, small buttons. I don't. They terrify me. I don't know what they do. Well, it wasn't too hard hard of a learn right there. Yeah, this bit's easy. It's just I, I just any anything technical just like really scares me. I just don't. I don't have a clue with stuff. <laughs> Fellow chocolate day. <laughs> um right well let's jump straight into it usually um i was saying to to cod like last time he was on because like the bears who've been around for a long time we all kind of like know the people and and stuff like this and so you can you kind of forget that there's new people joining all the time um, right so just for like kind of new people i thought it'd be good to kind of hear your story of how you found owen and and that kind of thing you know just to just to kind of start off Okay, cool. Yeah, I was down in Costa Rica, and um, my friend David Weiss, you know, Flat Earth Dave, mm -hmm. he was like, he's like, dude, this this comedian, this really funny comedian, Owen, he's losing his shit over the Flat Earth. And uh, <laughs> so I tuned in, you know, and I was laughing so hard. 
there was like a week where every night he was doing proofs outside mm -hmm. yeah. and he was like howling at the moon and he literally embodied what i went through in 2016 right like i i, I could feel his pain yeah i i i knew exactly what he, and he's like man i don't want to be a flat earther i really don't want to be a flat earther <laughs> and i i just i just thought it was so funny mm. and then like a, a few months later he started bringing up a bunch of the podcasts that i did with mike williams and oh. he, he, yeah, he um, he brought my name up three times in a row in three three successive days, and I was like, mm -hmm. I always use three as like a as a like a as a a prompt yeah. essentially from heaven. <laughs> and so I saw I forget what he was uh, uh, what he was on Instagram, but uh, I just reached out to him. I was like, Hey, dude, I'm Christopher Gardner. You know, you've been bringing up the Mike Williams interviews from from 2015 and 2016. And he's like, Gardner, holy shit, you want you want to go on a stream? And I think we streamed like within two days. And then we were fast friends cool. from that point on. Yeah, I think I think we've all gone through that. Well, not all of us, because not everyone believes the same thing. But we've all, whether it's Flat Earth, whether it's 9-11, whatever it is, we've all kind of gone through that process of kind of like, realizing that is a lie and then the bigger picture and what what that then means mm -hmm. um and i think that's the i think everyone's got that they can always it's almost like the jfk moment which obviously is another one but it's like it's that moment where you kind of like you realize right okay this reality isn't what i think it or what i thought it was um and i think that i think it terrifies a lot of people but it's, for us i think it's more exciting i think it's 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 that that's kind of like it, it gives you like an energy of like, okay well what is it then and what let, let's let's find out what else we're up to yeah yeah it when i was exposed to the flat earth stuff it was from david weiss actually and at the time i was pursuing a relationship with a woman in in central europe right. and i was in like this like completely like closed down space everybody mm. i was talking to you everyone I, I no one wanted to yeah. to go there with me mm. and uh, uh, my friend my friend moshe daniel who i have on my podcast a lot he's an alchemist and a, a doctor and a scientist and i brought it up to him and i'm like moshe i've been looking at this for two weeks man Pro prove it right wrong and he went through the same thing that owen went through <laughs> and that i went through and at the other end he's like oh my god this is it's flat and so yeah i think anybody who's earnest and truth seeking you mm -hmm. you kind of have to go through the looking glass yeah. with that and, mm -hmm. and humble yourself to whatever the evidence you know portends what i mean ultimately it, it there's nothing we can do about it um but it's it's kind of nice to know <laughs> do you know what I mean it's it's always helpful to know like where you are and what you're standing on and and then it, it brings you closer to to nature and all because it, it's then right well it is by design then it is you know we're not just kind of pointless things just floating through space right there is a, a reason for it all um and you know we again we're never going to know what that reason is but everything around as we can then use which then gets into using the earth and using you know all that kind of thing um so it's mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a very useful kind of starting point and then i think it, it prompts you and it pushes you to then look into more stuff mm -hmm. definitely it also helps to di dislodge lies out of your out of your system yeah so that's something like people don't understand the more lies you believe the more it disempowers like it like shrinks your soul yeah it's and that's why we're lied to constantly the number one weapon that's used against us is lies mm -hmm. so that's why cultivating a very healthy level of discernment is so and it's so important in, in these days because we're we're literally lied to about anything that's important yeah. <laughs> so you know to to have the capacity to discern your environment mm -hmm. um i think it adds to your strength i think yeah. it really adds to the capacity 
opportunity to navigate. Mm-hmm. I mean, we've seen it recently with, with all the COVID stuff. I mean, a lot of us kind of saw it early on, you, you know, what 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 do we plan? I mean, I, I did an Instagram post in uh, January 2020 saying when, when they were talking about it in China. Um, and I said, you know, it, it was something like a, about a mystery virus or something. So I said, we'll get ready for your mystery vaccine. Because you could tell that just the way the news was giving us all this information about three people who were sick in China. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it wouldn't normally be on the news, you know. So it was obvious they were planning. So they're, they're just laying the groundwork and just setting the, the, the table for more to come. Um, but I think because we... Because our eyes are open to the lies, I think we, we can see the things early on. We can see the spells early on and, and kind of link them all up in our head. And I think it becomes obvious when you try and explain it to somebody else. So there's been a few times when I've been trying, like my, some of my friends don't, they're not interested in any of it. But we were talking about um, COVID or, or whatever. And they're saying, you know, well, why would they lie? Or what, what would, they? and then you're trying to explain it. And then you, 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 before you know it, you're talking about the Titanic and you're talking about, <laughs> doing all these other things yeah and it, it, until you kind of until you've got a grasp of it it's mm-hmm. very hard to kind of see these spells i think um and you, we kind of i don't think we realize how much we how much we know right right yeah i mean there's every reason in the world to lie as owen puts it you know people lie for money they lie mm-hmm. for power they lie for influence you know and, and it, it's it's pretty pervasive it's one of those things that um, I think, you know, at least metaphorically, the father of lies, you know, Satan, mm-hmm. however you're going to call that, that, when it's said in the Bible, like, he rules the world. I think that's what they're kind of talking about. I think a lot of people are conflict avoidant. Yeah. And because they're conflict avoidant and they're insecure, lies come forward, you know? So have you always been, like, um, I hate the phrase truther because it's been so kind of, like, taken over. Um, but, you know, mm-hmm. have, have you always been into, like, the, the kind of the conspiracy side and, you know, stuff like that? Or, or was it just one day you saw something and then that changed everything? It's kind of funny that you bring this up. This came up earlier today in a, di- in a different podcast. Um, I was always weird. And I had a weird upbringing. Mm-hmm. So my my dad, like I grew up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Right. And when I was growing up in the 80s, that was like the huge surge in cocaine money in South Florida. Mm-hmm. Right. Like South Florida was built on cocaine mm-hmm. money. And my dad had built skyscrapers. And right. he was usually, he was usually the owner's rep for these multi multi-million dollar skyscraper construction projects Mm -hmm. so my dad would build these huge buildings and then nobody would be in them (laughs) like they would have like zero occupancy you know and so i saw that as a kid and i thought that was weird and then also he would take me to like hurricane uh materials testing like they would shoot two by fours at you know glass panes to see if they're hurricane rated and do all that type of stuff and so i was always kind of confused why the adults were so like everything was was a hypocrisy Hmm. like okay so you hurricane test these buildings and you know that this, this material won't last at this mile per hour and you know we're going to get hit by hurricanes but yet you still build with it uh-huh. you know and then i think one of my very first like truther moments was at a fourth of july block party right. and there were all these vietnam vets you know this is like 1982 or 83 mm-hmm. i was a little kid uh-huh. and i noticed just all the men that were like super angry and were like complaining about the vietnam war and how the war machine you know chewed them up and all this stuff and like for hours and hours and hours these men were drinking and like some of them would fight Mm. and they were just angry yeah and then at night when the star spangled banner came on they were the ones that were crying and like and so at a very early age i saw that pride was linked to anger Uh 
there was a link. I, I always noticed this. I noticed this in my father, too. He would be very, very angry. Like, there was an anger infused in what he was proud about. Yeah. And I, I, that, was like a, that was like a contradiction to me. Uh -huh. And so I think I had an eye for noticing lies and contradictions. Uh -huh. and, um, and then I just had a lot of exposure. You know, I've, I've been blessed to be like exposed to so many different things from different vantage points that mm -hmm. it always just kind of had me like being a, riding the fence and watching what's going on inside the pen, not being actually mm -hmm. in the pen for whatever reason. Like my astrology is like that. Like my, my celestic profile is very much of somebody that's like an observer and a commentator of humanity. Mm -hmm. But, um, um, yeah, it's, it's tr truther. I mean, like, it's crazy. Like, like when you grow up, like where I was in Florida growing up, like there was just so much, uh, turmoil, mm -hmm. like the, the Haitians and the Jamaicans were fighting each other. When I was in high school, I had to deal with all these riots. I, I went to a Jewish prep school before and I was a goy. So I had to deal with that stuff. Like, I just had so much weird exposure in my mm. life that I don't I don't really believe anybody with what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. I'd say it's a good place to be, I suppose. Because that's the, that's the thing. I mean, it, what one person's truth, it, you know, half the stuff we believe in now is complete nonsense. You know, um, we'll be all proven wrong in a few years, and you know, we've we've backed the wrong horse in some in some situations. Um, what were they doing with those buildings? And were they? Were they ever filled, or were they, it, was it just like a, a money laundering thing, or why, why would money go? laundering? Right. Yeah, money laundering. And then I saw like there was these videos that were popping up in like 2015, 2016 on YouTube mm -hmm. that were showing skyscrapers all around the world yeah. that were essentially empty, yeah. and how they were like used as like uh, essentially big lightning rods. There was this right. wonderful video of the Chicago Tower that had, had 26 minutes of lightning hit it. 26 minutes. Constantly or over like a, a time period? Like, it, I mean, it was like, it wasn't like a yeah. constant bolt of lightning. With but it was like lightning strike, break, yeah. lightning strike, break, break, really big lightning strike break and it was for now i don't i can't corroborate whether or not that video is real mm -hmm. but the hypothesis that was being stated was like a lot of these, these buildings are essentially these big metal monstrosities that go up in the air and are hyper conductive mm -hmm. and in the video they had a picture of the original uh, Mason's placard at the bottom of the Empire State Building. Right. And that placard said, oh, this this building supplies energy to such and such boroughs of Manhattan. Oh, okay. Yeah, dude. And so that gets into all the Antiquitex stuff and, like, why are they shielding, you know, thousand-foot buildings with me clad metal, you know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't make it doesn't make that much sense, right? I mean, it does from mm -hmm. a, a from a structural engineering perspective, but mm -hmm. if you're trying to electrostatically, you know, insulate yourself from your environment, yeah. you wouldn't you wouldn't yeah. build like that. <laughs> and so, I think it's a combination of we really don't know how the grid works. Mm -hmm. They tied these massive buildings into the grid, obviously, and I think usually you see skylines erupt in areas that have bigger populations. Mm -hmm. And so it might be like a, re a reverse energy condenser for, for the grid. Mm -hmm. that, that might be the way. Because the, there are certain guilds within architecture. There's like only like three or four really large construction companies in the United States that builds all the skyscrapers. Right, okay. So, so that I'm kind of thinking, like, the, like similar with NASA, you know, there'd, be, there'd have to be so many people in on it and all this if you've only got four companies. 
Yeah, yeah, you don't need that many people. Like, I have friends that work. I have a girlfriend that I've known since high school that she's a lawyer. She's an architect, but she works in the lawyer firm that vets the largest construction company in the world. Right. And she doesn't know anything. Uh -huh. She's literally there. She says she has the worst job in the world. She's just there to see whether or not the, the plans that come through follow code. Right. You know, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't think of a worse job in the world <laughs> as an architect to have. Yeah. You know what well, I'm saying? Well, Sammy, surely you don't need to be an architect for that. Surely it's just you've got code and you've got the things and you just, you know, you, it's, it's almost like data input as much as anything else. It doesn't seem, she seems overqualified for the job. Um, I don't know all the ins and outs of it. You have to be able to read plans pretty, pretty well. You need to be able to draw plans to be able to read them. Mm -hmm. You know, right. I have plenty. I have plenty of foremen that I've had to fire because they can't read plans. Right. So, um, obviously, you've seen like the the kind of the mud flood stuff and the tart area and all that, and and obviously there's a lot of that within the within that with you know the buildings and the conductors and and all that kind of thing and what like you know cathedrals used to be and stuff. So, are, are you kind of on board with that, or have you kind of you know a little bit either way on it? Well. I, I think no matter what we've been lied to about our history, I mean, that's pretty oh. obvious. Um, I, I know people that have like studied the architecture of a lot of cathedrals mm -hmm. and studied the resonant, the resonant patterns of the cathedrals, at least seven of them. Mm -hmm. And now that they're doing testing on some of these, the lower basement levels of these cathedrals and that they're finding not only are there there are subfloors that people didn't know about, you know, like these cathedrals are built on much older buildings, yeah. but they're also finding that the substances are harder than rock. They're essentially, a lot of them are geopolymers, right. and a lot of these vaulted basement areas are not only geopolymers, but they're piezoelectric geopolymers. Right. So, dude, that, that's some advanced advanced mm -hmm. building yeah and I, I knew this i think this is one of the things that owen really vibed with me about it was like one of the first quotes uh from from my mike williams interviews that he really he really uh jived with was i said like when i was a kid i was looking at, at pictures of my family from the turn of the 20th century in pittsburgh mm -hmm. and they were all chiseled like their jaws were perfect Big wide set eyes, just beautiful. Everybody's like stern in the mm -hmm. photo, dressed to the nines. Like, and I, as a little kid, I marveled at how beautiful these people were. Mm -hmm. Like, just, just the just the percentage wise, I'm looking at my family photo, and I'm like, they're all beautiful. Mm -hmm. Like, they're all like, and in this was I was in the '80s. I was thinking people don't look like no. that anymore. Now, like now, people really don't look like <laughs> that anymore. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And, so, and so, I I said in the Mike Williams interview, I was like, dude, we come from very, very dignified roots, mm -hmm. and pe people don't understand the law of entropy. Mm -hmm. And the law of entropy is in a physical system as it as it moves forward in time, it degrades. Mm -hmm. So they're trying to tell us the the inverted history that we're given is that right now we're the most advanced we've ever been well they invert everything yeah that's not true even it even because we have electrical doodads and we can do this who's to say you know a few hundred years ago we just didn't do it telepathically mm -hmm. yeah exactly you know i mean that's that's the thing it's it's not the i don't think the people are more advanced I think maybe like some of the technology is certainly like from recent history, you know. So we have more than the the people in those photos did, but they probably knew more about stuff than we do. I mean, there's there's a lot of dumb people now. I mean, you know, there probably was then, but there's we're we're very reliant on it now. Whereas in the past, they didn't have that, so they weren't, and so they they, they couldn't afford to not know stuff. Well, it's very obvious to me because my. One of my lines of work is I I'm, I do massage therapy and polarity therapy, and whenever some, 
somebody experiences a physical trauma, mm -hmm. they store it in their body yeah. and they will actually, that area will atrophy mm -hmm. and that area will become very acidic and it will positively polarize. And so I think it, you know, after, you know, just being in the world for a little bit of time, it's very obvious that the collective consciousness has been traumatized. Mm -hmm. And that ha happens through catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And I've read enough book books now to know that the nominalism that they taught is a lie. We don't come, come from this very standard, you know, very, you know, constant, uh, <laughs> uh, non-rhythmic, just this linear mm -hmm. progression of time and what they call it uniformitarianism, you right. know? No, 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 no. Our history is not uniform. Uh -huh. That's not true. It's very obvious that we have like a, a collective amnesia, uh -huh. you know, and that comes from trauma. That comes from something big. And that's why, like, you're asking about the mud flood stuff. It's so obvious that areas of this world were mud flooded. Uh -huh. Like, I'm a builder. I People like spend a lot of money for me to build them arches because <laughs> I'm a builder that builds arches and vaults and domes and shit. Right. Mm -hmm. has, has any of my clients ever said, Hmm, okay, Gardner, what I want from you is on the first story of my building, I want you to dig down about a third of the way, build these full doorways with vaulted arches. Okay. <laughs> no step downs whatsoever. And then back, Backfill the earth with no water guard midway through the opening and then go ahead and just use brick or use some other masonry product that doesn't fit the original masonry of the building to backfill that. I haven't had one client ask me that yet. I mean, it's still time. Maybe, maybe you will. <laughs> <laughs> it's because it's stupid. That's not true. It's totally not true. And here's the cool thing. I've lived now, I lived in Central America for 15 years where th there was li liquefaction. My second year there, we had a crazy rainy season. And the whole ground was super saturated during the rainy season. Right. And then we had a... Uh, we had three earthquakes in a row, including a 7.1 earthquake. Right. And I watched really nice buildings sink into the ground. Mm -hmm. Like, Meh! and so then in Christchurch, in what was that, 2011, with that Christchurch earthquake mm -hmm. in uh, New, New Zealand, mm -hmm. where they literally had videos of like cars just sinking in and then the ground rematerializing. Mm -hmm. And like the car was halfway in the ground i'm like that's that was the mud flood stuff yeah. and so i think that there were all these different events it wasn't like a tsunami of mud you know i'm not yeah. thinking that i'm thinking it was much more of like a liquefaction mm -hmm. event because i one of my clients he's a how should i say this a very very high end he owns a very high end mining company right so so what do they do to mine now? They'll spray, they'll super saturate an area. Mm -hmm. They get, get all the crusher fines to come down and then they vibrate the shit out of it. And as they vibrate it, the the bigger stuff rises to the top. Mm -hmm. The denser, smaller stuff goes to the bottom. The, the stuff of less density comes up, mm -hmm. the things of higher density go down and then they just grade it. Yeah. Our Earth does that, that through earthquakes. That's exactly like these earthquakes, depending on the saturation rate of the ground, that's exactly what happens. So do you think, because you'll know way more than me about this, obviously earthquakes are like a natural thing, but do you, do you think it's a like a fault with the Earth that causes the earthquake, or do you think it, it's almost like it, the, the Earth, it's by design that we have earthquakes? I think does it, that make sense? I think it's all of the above. You know, I had this like real come to Jesus moment in my bathtub, my outdoor bathtub in Costa Rica. It was one of these settings, serene setting. A rainstorm was coming in off the ocean. I'm sitting there. I had this outdoor bathtub that was, you know, heated with the rocket mass heater, and I'm 
smelling the smoke of the tropical wood and I'm looking out and the wind's blowing. And you would think in that natural setting, I'd be like, oh, mother nature. I have the exact I had the exact opposite. I literally had the epiphany come over me. I'm like, oh my God, this is all engineered. Mm -hmm. All of it. Mm -hmm. It's a hundred percent engineered. Mm -hmm. And then like a, a year later, I saw the uh, Hunger Games movie where they were all mm -hmm. like on that inside the dome mm -hmm. and they had like the 12 different zones of the dome and they kept changing the, the environmental inputs. Mm -hmm. And I think, that's closer to what we live in i mm. think we lived in i think we live in a contained part of the larger let's just say the larger realm yeah. we they, they indoctrinate us at a very young age to say oh hey there's seven continents and it's spherical and this is where you're at and trust us because <laughs> everything else that we've told you we're trustworthy about <laughs> bullshit it's the exact opposite they literally have us in a in a zone that they control you know and that zone is i won't say it's as engineered as it was in the hunger games mm -hmm. but the hunger yeah. game the hunger game movie was a great metaphor mm -hmm. for what what I, I think we're actually in mm -hmm. i mean obviously with like the hunger games and stuff you're doing it on a smaller level as well so it's far easier to you know, to contain it or to to affect certain things. If you're doing it on a on a grander scale like we are, you, I suppose you that's why they take the time over certain certain gravels or certain things because they've, they've got to make sure that all the parts are in the right place first. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, how do you think they? they I don't know if you would answer this or not, but how how do you think that they like? are in control do you know what I mean because I, 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 I struggle with this and i think like well are they are they are they people like us are they you know a completely di different thing that we've we've never seen before in our lives that's controlling do you know what well, i mean because it's it well, seems like it's go on. <laughs> this is like a multi multi-layered question they look a lot like us mm -hmm. you know they might even be from a biological perspective, they might be human, hmm. but I've I've been around people uh, like I've had to inadvertently exercise demons, you know, right. from from clients and friends. And there's, I mean, this world is absolutely this the life is, is stranger than fiction like um, truth is stranger than fiction like we live in a very uh multi-dimensional very layered existence uh -huh. and the, the reason why the controllers you know they really go after the young and program the young is they know that your biggest containment field is your mind uh -huh. so, so if they can, the first seven years of your life, you know, continue that way, yeah. you know, give you the fluoride, give you the, the jabs, do mm -hmm. all the things that, you know, put a globe in front of you, yeah. have triceratops as your first word, all these things, mm -hmm. you don't understand that like totally condenses and makes your universe small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when they put your hope in something that isn't true, like they put your hope in space. Mm. Like I grew up during like the science fiction heyday of the mm. 80s and 90s where every other movie is a science fiction movie. So I was pro programmed with space is the final frontier. That's where hope is, hope, mm. hope. In fact, the first Star Wars, it starts off the new hope, like hope, 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 space, hope. And so it's, it's you get people you get kids to believe in that mm -hmm. they're self-contained yeah because as a kid by the time you're seven or eight years old they're like oh the only way you can get to out there is to be an astronaut mm -hmm. and then you hear the, the statistics of who becomes an astronaut yeah. and then like me i was going to be an astronaut until i'm on my school roof and watching the challenger explode mm -hmm. over my head mm -hmm. yeah. Then I'm like, I'm not going to be an astronaut. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to get to touch hope. I'm not going to get to touch yeah. space. Like, you see what I'm saying? How mm -hmm. they contain the mind? Yeah. And so 
I, I started writing, I had a novel like, you know, fall into me like 11 years ago. And the way the novel starts is the very first line from the protagonist is, there's more land. Right. Because there is. Uh -huh. these, these people are essentially weak because living men like you and I, we are actually alive and we're connected to our creator. Uh -huh. I have a few feeling that the, the, the beings that try and manipulate us and parasite our energy off of us, mm -hmm. I have an impression that they're not actually connected to the creator. Right. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And because they're not connected to the creator, mm -hmm. they have to find, they have to get their juice from living beings. Mm -hmm. And so they can contain these living beings as much as they can to extract the energy that they need. No, that makes sense. It does, and, and people think, ask, people well, ask me all, all the time, like, why, why are we not just, why don't they just kill us? And it's, first of all, it's a free will need, realm. Mm -hmm. And second of all, they want our energy. Yeah. It, our energy is essential to them. Yeah. Like, it, everything's inverted. So, if you have what's his name saying, oh, we're useless eaters. Yeah, on the material level, a lot of us are useless eaters. Mm -hmm. But on a whole another level, mm -hmm. there's this energy that they, they're they watching. They're like, holy shit, he did something spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. She, she created life out of nothing. And, like, that's, like, for them, they need to plug into that. Mm -hmm. No, and... Um and just going back to what you were saying about the with space and so i think we're naturally we have this like natural kind of explorer dna within in us you know we're always kind of looking for the next bit of land or the next bit of whatever so if they if they do trap your mind early on then it's well yeah you can explore but just within this these boundaries so knock yourselves out go and like, go and go and have a look but then right. you can't go up because the only the only way out is up and only we go up, and if you try it, you'll die. So but don't do that. Right. Um, I mean, it's very, it's very kind of Truman Show, you know, with the with the with the water, and you know, the you know, he's scared to to leave, and it, you know, it's 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 basically the same thing, isn't it? You know, it, like you said, if you trap your mind early, then yeah. you've, you've got this kind of almost like a, a a protection around you of well, yeah, this this area is safe to explore, but if I go into space, I'm going to be sucked into a vacuum and. I'm not going to be able to breathe, and I'm going to do you know I mean all this nonsense. Um, yeah. But this bit's safe, so I, I can't I can't explore this bit. So yeah, yes. it's it's, um, it's amazing what they can, how they can mold you so early. I mean, it, I I've got um I've got a, a Spanish uncle and a Greek uncle, and obviously all the kids are bilingual because my aunties are English, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's just because you know obviously they're born with both languages. And so by the age of two or three, they're fluent in two languages. And it's just, mm. it's so easy to mold a young mind. It's so easy to kind of like teach people things. But then it's yes. very hard to unteach them. Yes. <laughs> That's a great way to say it. <laughs> um, I've just got a couple of questions here because I, I asked people to send questions in. Um, so I don't want to get later on and then I'm like bombarding you with a lot of, a lot of stuff. Um, so two acre ND bear has sent two in. He said, given some sort of flat plane model, do you believe the continents are drifting? Mm. It's more, what we have evidence for is that the sky is drifting more than our, mm. more than the, 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 more than what the, the, the Terra, mm -hmm. you know, so it's like Mother Earth is like, she stays stationary, but Father Sky is moving mm -hmm. over us. Yeah. And I really like the, I, I like the prog model, like the prog clock model. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the, yeah. prog, prog, in the prog clock model, you know, if you look at it, it's, it's, a, it's a circle within another circle mm -hmm. within another circle. And the two smaller circles create an ellipse. And where mm -hmm. you see the, the ellipse is the zone that we're moving towards. And if, apparently before they modified all the different uh, 
the the plane ecliptic, like the zodiac, uh -huh. which is the plane ecliptic, the Maseroth, before they modified it, it actually had the correct Maseroth. Uh -huh. It had the 13, the 13 signs along the ecliptic right there in the the actual ellipse would be pointing to what age we were going into. Right. Okay. And so I'm I'm of the mind that just like I was saying earlier with the uh, with the Hunger Games model, mm -hmm. that the let's just say the cathode and the anode of the sun and the moon. Mm -hmm. um, even though there's there's a lot of evidence that the moon is not necessarily a been a permanent fixture in the sky, mm -hmm. well, it's just for shits and giggles say it's a permanent fixture in the sky. Those those two, they they their polarities and whatever they're over, they kind of illuminate and give heat to and give both the septic and the antiseptic light. Right. If one those shift they're actually following the greater circle which is polaris polaris mm -hmm. is the real center and everything is like a maypole it's it's pivoting off of polaris and every age the that the sun and the moon are moving to a newer or to not newer but to an area of the of the greater plane so you have new New areas melting and coming into and like oh my god there's you know 90 new islands off Japan whatever and then you have other areas that are covered in ice right mm -hmm. and I think this is a it, I think this is a really beautiful cycle if that's what's happening because mm -hmm. it gives rest to areas that have been that have been abused yeah I mean do you see do you see the like the land it's, I mean, where I live, so I'm, I'm in England, so if you look at, like, the shape of Britain, mm -hmm. it, it, it looks like it's snapped off from France at some point. Yeah. Um, you know, so, and, and it, it, there's a lot of countries like that where you can kind of, like, push them a little bit and they'll join back up together. Um, so do you think originally it was kind of, like, just, just land, and, land and water and then it's just kind of broken up over time, or do you think it was... It's been redesigned. Do you know what I mean like a deliberate kind of like no that 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 we'll push that over there and do, do you know what I mean? Do you think it's a natural thing or do you think it's again by design? Okay, so this is you have to get into the definition of what is natural. Yeah. <laughs> like in in the chat, you know, this has been a big point of contention. Like, what is what is natural? Um, so let me say this: I really think this this place that we're in is highly highly engineered mm -hmm. oh, like yeah. to an extent that is like mind-boggling mm -hmm. like and I, that that gives me actually a lot of um hope yeah. <laughs> you know i went to i went to a, a a tech conference in 2008 it was tesla tech in new mexico right. and we were selling these orgone accumulators and we met all these geniuses there. We met guys that were extracting all these precious metals from magnetite. We met guys that had electrically charged water that when you would drink it, after you would drink it, you you could like bring your finger within an inch of somebody and send a, a shock to them. Like there were so many things. And there were these old, old timers there that did everything analog. Uh -huh. They didn't do email. They didn't do. They they would meet each other. They would meet at a diner, you know. Mm -hmm. And these guys, they told me flat out, they're like, Topher, everything is surveilled. Mm -hmm. There's nothing that's electric that isn't surveilled, mm -hmm. and that put me at ease. Yeah, because I was like, ah. That's right. Everything, yeah, everything is completely and utterly being watched. Uh -huh. And I feel, I feel like that's what God's doing anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm like, you know, hey, if if I die a good death by pursuing that which that I'm passionate about, 
even though the corrupt influences of the world don't want it, hey, I die a good death. That's mm -hmm. not a big deal. You know, it, it, it doesn't end. And I think that, that this whole, I guess you would say landscape, this whole, you know, you know plane of existence, physical plane of existence that we live on is very much the plane of inertia. Uh -huh. And from a physics perspective, inertia is the tendency for things to stay at rest uh -huh. or something not wanting to move. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, and I, I experience that pretty readily that this is this is the place for spirit to come and slow down mm -hmm. and not really move. And I think you're only here as long as you need to be until you realize, oh, wait a minute. I am, I am spirit. I am one with my creator. I am, I am, I am that. And, and I, I fully trust. Mm -hmm. And then when, you fully trust, you know, God does with your spirit what, what, what it will, you know, that's what happens. And that in more, more likely than not, the malleability of this plane of inertia is just a function of consciousness. Uh -huh. And it's just a function to say, hey, do not make a false idol of this land. Because we, uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll admit it. I still have a tendency to make false idols. Yes. I think we, but, I think, again, I think it's a natural thing, isn't it? I think we always kind of, we're always looking for, for someone to be the answer or so, someone to be like the best at something or, or, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? That, and that's the, who we, whether it's a, like that, that's who we admire, aspire to be like, or whatever, or, or envy, do you know what I mean? whatever that is. It's. I think it's a natural thing within us where we're always looking for like, well, who's the best at that? Who's the, you know, whatever. Um, so, I mean, and especially if that's, you know, God or, or Jesus or, you know, whoever it happens to be, you know, then that's, I think, like I say, I think it's a natural thing within us. But, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's also a dangerous thing. Mm -hmm. um, just on the inertia thing, Obviously, like, and I, I look at things more from like a, like a, like a mechanical point of view because I, I, I'm gonna get my head around that more. Um, and within engines, there's there's something that that kind of mechanics strive to or, or engine builders strive to do, and it's to get the polar moment of inertia. So ba basically, right. where the I'm not, I'm gonna explain it like a retard, but like <laughs> where where the the energy taken to do something it is like compensated by the energy that it it generates or whatever so it's it's basically yeah. like it's almost like floating or whatever and that's like mm -hmm. the goal that's like the, the perfect thing to do so you're not you're not wasting energy but you're also getting the most out of that and then it, it ends up as like a like a plateau if that makes sense yes um and so i think if for the earth i think that that's a it's basically what the earth does it seems to be in that state sort of constantly where you know if it's if it's too hot, it'll rain, uh, you know, and, and cool itself down. And we have the day, and then we have the night to do the opposite. And it, it always seems to kind of like to be in that state where it's 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 never going to sort of like ruin itself, if you like. It's it's always kind of like going to keep itself going and just keep itself ticking over without too much effort. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 a very very well engineered space mm -hmm. to be in. Yeah. Do you think it's the only one, or do you think there's, you know, another six million out there, or do you think we we are the only kind of like, I know I'm not talking about the land, I'm talking like you know whatever it is overall. Do you think there's there's another load of them somewhere else designed by other people or designed by do you know what I mean whatever God is, as the, a a load of other gods who then have made like similar ones or. You know I. I've contemplated that a bunch. I have a tendency to think that there is more than one space, mm -hmm. more than one plane of inertia. Mm -hmm. You know, a, a bunch of the ether physicists that I've studied were pretty convinced that there's different life zones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, I, I I have a tendency to think that's so. 
you know um you know we're all always kind of being hinted at with the truth when they say oh extraterrestrials mm -hmm. like there's extra territory yeah. and that extra territory might be a, a dimension mm -hmm. uh -huh. that extra territory might be an ener an energetic uh um, it, it might have a, a a dimension in magnitude but not in space or time you know mm -hmm. Like there's all these in between spaces. Like when you yeah. deal with spirits and walk-ins mm -hmm. and stuff like that, mm -hmm. they don't necessarily take up a volume mm -hmm. of 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 space that you and I occupy. Mm -hmm. Yet, they, yet they have an effect within the volumetric space. Mm -hmm. So, uh, like like I said, I think truth is much weirder yeah. than fiction. <laughs> well, that's the thing. I mean, we can only we can only picture things in our mind or whatever of, of things that we understand. And so, obviously, when when we're talking about this kind of stuff, we've no idea. I mean, it, it it could be anything. It could be anywhere. But when I when I picture it, I'm just picturing like little earths like all around. That you know, I'm almost like on a dinner table or whatever. And there's loads of like different coasters, and and each one of those has been designed by somebody else. And it it's probably something completely different to that and like you said it's you know different realms different dimensions different whatever you know and we can't we can't even contemplate that i do think, I think like i like how the bible has hierarchies mm -hmm. you know and i was a a a, a bad student of rudolf steiner right. <laughs> i was learning rudolf steiner from a bunch of germans in the jungle so like <laughs> my my interpretation of rudolf steiner is is probably not exactly what he was trying to say but he talked a lot about, about the angelic hierarchies right and and that's a lot of what i experienced mm -hmm. like i had i i had a death experience as a young boy right. and i was in a different realm and there were what to my four-year-old mind appeared to be angels there right and in that in in those angels like one of them directed me to come back so i i've always had an affinity for the whole angel lore that's just my conditioning mm -hmm. that's like my yeah that's my yeah. that's my bias mm -hmm. so I, I gravitated to really jiving with like rudolf steiner and really jiving with um oh what's his name uh, um want to call him maxwell it's not that but anyway the, the whole it's like christian mysticism it's like mm -hmm. okay there is a christ in the christ did embody and the christ was the the perfected being like that was the perfected man that knew on, on a physical mental spiritual level his direct jurisdiction with his father the mm -hmm. creator and he knew that uh, and the story of Christ, I, 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 I like because in, in, in that he wasn't relative to this plane of existence. Yes. <laughs> like he was literally, you know, in the story, in the, in the Christian and Jewish mythos, they took him out. Uh -huh. And so, because I got to tell you, the, when I get super clean, and when I, I should say, when I have gotten like uh -huh. super clean, doing all the practices, doing all the things I know I need to do, uh -huh. I notice that there's not that many people that can stand to be around me. <laughs> <laughs> Could you even imagine on somebody like on the Christ level, like, uh -huh. you know, that's like a billion times that? Yeah, he's, he's going to be judging a lot isn't he he's, he's going to be very judgy <laughs> so he's, he's gonna... <laughs> well it's not even that is people are going to judge him because people yeah. always project their shit yeah so like when you're around somebody that's super happy uh -huh. they don't a super happy person never is trying to butt into your life yeah, but when you see that that person isn't isn't into any of the vices that you're into that person isn't doing all this you start to project onto them that they're judging you yeah and you know i read this wonderful book in my 20s called the murder of christ by wilhelm reich and that whole 
whole book goes into how we build up a, a, a Meshiach. We build a, a savior figure so that we can kill them. Right, okay. And this is our psychology. <laughs> and I've noticed it in almost every book. It, it's something that is endemic to the age that we're in, mm -hmm. is that like, you, you'll start to admire somebody and you'll be like, oh my God, this person is so wonderful. And then just by being in their, in their light, mm -hmm. then you see your own blemishes mm -hmm. and then you hate, hate them for it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and this we, is what we, like all the time with with Owen and you know the the people who are like that. You know, the, it it's usually the ones who freak out the most are the ones that a month ago were the the most special of bears, and they were like the ones who who loved Owen the most, and they were the ones who would love the community the most, and all this. And then there'll be something ridiculous that triggers them, and then mm -hmm. it brings back all this stuff, to, and and then that's it. They hate everybody. Everyone's evil everyone's going to hell everyone's doing whatever um it's never the people who who haven't made him an idol or haven't made him this this thing it's always the ones who have like i said they've, they've they're the special bearer of the week and you can see it coming like now we now we've seen the cycles you can you can tell like the ones who are going to be the next ones to spaz out right uh, let me just get through some of these questions because they are piling up a little bit. Um, Paul Bear says, when you were building the dome in Terra Alta, did you climb Pico? Did you explore the pyramids in the Azores while there? No. No. I was building for a bunch of... Uh, I was building for... Um, what was the name of that permaculture school there? Essentially, I was running a workshop for all these kids in the EU. In the EU, if you're doing like a green project, mm -hmm. well, you know this because where you live, yeah. the university will pay you like 2,000 or 2,200 euros per semester to go learn some green, some green project, whatever. Anything with green in the title. Yeah. And so in 2014, I went over to Terra Alta, and uh, I was in Alma Sajem, uh, Portugal, mm -hmm. because I was also build building for the Boom Festival in Portugal that year. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was great, but I have to say, the, the European kids that were in my program were, were the la laziest. <laughs> like I, it was the only workshop I've ever done where I did all the work. Like I was just so, other than the farm owner, like Terra Alta's farm mm -hmm. owner, and like one other assistant that wasn't even taking the course. He was just there because his sister was there. Like all the kids that had the free euros to go mm -hmm. to that thing, they did nothing. Yeah. <laughs> I was so exhausted. <laughs> Yeah, it's a, it is a very European trait, I think, to just to just be happy. It's almost like they're happy to do nothing, and that's that's the thing. Because I get I get lazy people. I, I get how some people are lazy, and some people can't be bothered or whatever. But they they're very content to be like that. Do you know what I mean? There, there doesn't seem to be like like if, if they're on a course or, or or like a workshop or whatever. Surely you want to get the most out of it as as you possibly no. can. People no, don't. That's, a, that, yeah. that's an incorrect, that's an assumption that you and I will make as living men. I've now taught probably two dozen workshops in the last 10 years. Yeah. And when I went to Cal Earth to learn Super Adobe, I took the extended course there, which was only five days because it's not mm -hmm. all that technically difficult to do. Right. And I was showing them the plans of what I was going to go build and the, all the instructors were like, you're going to go build that now. I'm like, yeah, as soon as I get back mm -hmm. to Costa Rica, uh, I'm building that. And they're like, wow, you're really ambitious. And I'm like, <laughs> well, doesn't everybody that come here to learn the technology build, they're mm -hmm. like one in a thousand, Crazy. one in a thousand people actually use it. So that's it. So the others are just going through the motions. They they feel like they should do something, and so they. they it's just something to do. Yeah. It's a fly to fancy. Mm -hmm. it, it's a fly to fancy. It's just something to do. But again, 
I mean, that's that's good for us because you know it's it's ours for the taking, really. You know, and that's that's another thing that kind of Corona taught us. So as long as you switched on, you, you you can we can pretty much do whatever we want. Yeah. Um, yeah. And no, and that no one no one's even wants to stop you. It's not like they they, they can't stop you or anything else. They, they just don't. They, they don't even notice you doing it. Exactly. They're not. They're not in the creation mode. Mm. You have people that are in creation mode. You ever see the movie The Nines with Ryan Reynolds? I don't think so. It's a pretty campy movie. It came out in like '07 or '08. It's like a B movie, but it's it has a really cool concept where like it's like most people are, are sevens mm -hmm. and sevens, you know, just go along to get along. And then you have your eights, and eights are like eights get shit done mm -hmm. but your nines they're the ones who really run shit right. they're like in they're in like god mode mm -hmm. and that's like that's like when you have real charisma that's like when you're constantly feeling appreciation and gratitude mm -hmm. and joy and like whatever the obstacle of course obstacle course of life throws at you mm -hmm. You're like, fuck it, let's let's do it. Let's yeah. like adapt, you know? And people you gotta understand, like the seven, sixes, and fives, they mm -hmm. see a person that looks at life that way. Mm -hmm. They don't care what you're doing. They're just around you for your energy. Mm -hmm. they, they just wanna be in that energetic pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I, I, exactly, exactly. And I don't I, I think most people now Especially here, it seems to be like threes in that <laughs> scale. <I don't> <laughs> I'm going to have to tell that from out though, because I'd, I'd like Ryan Reynolds. I know, I know it's like Ryan Reynolds, but I, I always, I think he's funny. I think he's a great like comedian actor, but I think he's he's good when he plays it straight as well. Mm -hmm. uh, right, Ukrainian, right, Ukrainian. I have got your other things in front of me as well. Your other questions that you sent me earlier. Um, but he's, he sent a question here, and he says, "Have you heard of Ken Wheeler?" And yeah. His and, and your thoughts on him? I I love a lot of his work. Um, mm -hmm. I studied under one of his teachers, um, Doctor Floyd Sweet, who's in Kentucky. Real well, he was in Kentucky. He's dead now. Mm -hmm. But Doctor Sweet was like the master gentleman on all magnetics right. and so i had been working diligently for like six years on a on a patent for a water purifier that dealt a lot with magnetics and i had studied floyd sweet's work and then um when i got turned on to theoria apophasis ken wheeler's youtube page he i saw a bunch of his pictures that he had had were of some of the work that Floyd Sweet had done, right. and then I found out they were. Then I found out that they like knew each other. Well, I didn't know. How should I say this? I knew that Ken had actually studied under him also. Uh -huh. So Floyd Sweet was like the the pen ultimate in the United States when it came to magnetics right. and what what magnetic lines of force are. What is what is a dielectric? What is a diamagnetic substance? Mm -hmm. All these things um, that, from a material science perspective, how pre energized materials can mm -hmm. actually do work consistently in, in this time, in, in the present moment. Mm -hmm. And so, um, that's what a magnet really is. It's it's a it's a ferrous material that's been energized, mm -hmm. polarized in a direction, and it's polarized with such a trauma, <laughs> with such a shock, literally, that it will do work for 40, 50 years without ever giving up. Yeah. And and um, it's a wonderful analogy for a lot of things in life. It's mm -hmm. awesome. They, I, we don't even. I mean, I don't. I don't even think about magnets. So just like, yeah, that's a magnet. I don't. I've never thought of where how a magnet is. Do you know what I mean like, or, or how you make a magnet? I've never, I've never like given it a second thought. It's just, yeah, it's a, it's a magnet. 
So yeah, the, the, so yeah. That what you do then? Is it, so what is it? Is it okay, I'm going to... Magnets are so cool because a magnet is some sort of like they used to call them lodestones when they'd find them out in nature. Right. So you have something like magnetite, which is iron oxide. Mm -hmm. A lightning storm comes in and a lightning hits the magnetite right. with gajillions of volts, millions of amps, whatever. And then it will create an adherence with all those little magnetite particles, mm -hmm. but it polarizes all of them in one direction right. the force of the energy polarizes and so the movement where the electricity enters is south pole and where the energy goes out is north pole right okay and so depending on the shape of the magnet mm -hmm. there's all this cool stuff that you can do because it creates a field around it mm -hmm. that does work mm -hmm. and so the the cool thing about water is water is a dielectric medium. So mm -hmm. if you put a magnet, very high powered magnets around dielectric mediums, mm -hmm. then the water starts to do all this really cool anomalous stuff. Right. And uh, you, you get some really wonderful effects. So you could have all this different chemical that's in the water, but when you wipe the memory of the water, <laughs> with the these magnets or you vortex the water and get the water moving in a direction through uh let's say a, a centripetal vorticular flow through a very specific magnetic field it doesn't matter what's in the water uh -huh. the water is at a different energy state and then that it that gives whatever it touches it imbues that with extra energy so where do you stand on the um you know the arches being magnets, like the the Arc de Triomphe and that kind of thing. I mean, is is there anything to that? Do you think, or uh, they're not a magnet in the sense of a ferrous magnet, mm -hmm. but they could be a geopolymer magnet. Mm. So there's different. Like we're we're all indoctrinated with only one type of electricity, yeah. you know, and there's multiple types of electricity. So, um. My teachers were very big into talking about telluric energy, which are magnetic lines of force from the earth. Right. So I think when you see these massive uh, masonry arch forms that are made out of um, different geopolymers, especially if the geopolymer is a substance that is, is piezoelectric or piezoelectric, mm -hmm. then I think it converts the sound the waves the vibration of everything that's going around into it into an electrical magnetic field right because i mean it, it just seems to be pointless don't they you know as far <laughs> <laughs> they definitely were not built to have people drive through them <laughs> yeah exactly and, and the time you were built as well i mean the amount it would be it would be a pointless thing to do now so certainly back then when you know they, they they had a lot better things they could have done with their time and resources. You know they they built these. I mean we've got Marble Arch in England. There's the Arc de Triomphe. I went to Barcelona in January. There's a massive one there, um, which I'd never heard of, and it's a huge thing where you walk under it and it's I don't, I don't know, like 20, 30 foot deep yeah. um, arch. And uh, all they're using it for now, there was there was someone uh, there was someone on that side selling paintings like caricatures, and then like leaning it all against the arch, and someone on this side busking because of like the acoustics under it, um, and that's what that's what we use it for our, our advanced um, lifestyle that we have now. We were using it for that, but yeah, it, it just seemed that I mean it, it was huge the one in Barcelona, so oh, it's. It, it, it's built for something, you know, more than just to walk on under. Oh, definitely. I think the majority of the vaults that I've studied that are built of the the piezoelectric geopolymers underneath cathedrals, um, yeah. they act like you know a lot of a lot of people don't know how speakers work, but a speaker you essentially have an arch form or a convex shape that mm -hmm. have the it has a magnet mm -hmm. and, 
And so I think what they did was they were treating the earth itself that it was like a reverse speaker. Mm. So the earth would be like what the bladder of the speaker would be. And then the arch form was the magnet. And so they would transduce the energy of all the vibratory state that was on the ground and they would collect it. Because it's very obvious we come from a heritage of etheric collectors. Uh -huh. They collected etheric energy, they collected static energy, and they stored it and they used it to do work. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the only explanation, really, that, that kind of makes sense. Because obviously, the, the, again, what we're told with timelines and, and all that, you know, the, these things are going to be impossible to do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so the, they have to have had some kind of energy system that we don't, you know, so we, we certainly don't use. I'm sure some people know about it, but we certainly don't use it. Right. Um, because, you know, it's, I mean, in England, we've got cathedrals and, and churches and stuff that were built in, like, 1100, and they're, they're, they're still here, and they're massive. You know, the like, right. Lincoln Cathedral, I think, was built in 1072 or something, or they started building it then. And it, it's ridiculous in size, you know? and there's no, there's no way that they could have done that then. Um, no. you know, so obviously, uh, you know, whatever the pyramids are and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it's it's been... This kind of energy and, and, and stuff has been known about for a long time, and then it sounds like, or seems like it's been erased somehow. So whether it is through shock and trauma, or whether it's, you know, something else. Well, I think I think the reason why the technology isn't in the mainstream is because if they allow the technology that actually builds these things to to be in the public, catastrophe. Yeah. You you can't have capitalism as it is done now you can't have the crony capitalism as it's done now with people having their eye on the horizon that uh, the next catastrophe is coming because mm -hmm. none of us all of us good-hearted people would be like oh it's not worth getting the next car it's not worth yeah. you know doing the corporate job or what no no one would do that mm -hmm. if we knew we only had like a really finite period of time mm -hmm. and hey something really big is going to happen and yeah. we know the timing of it uh -huh. all this disaster capitalism would not occur uh -huh. the last hundred years have been disaster capitalism uh -huh. it's like, like let's start a war let's clean up the war let's start another war let's clean up the war let's like kill millions of people with chemicals and let's clean up the chemicals uh -huh. it's all this cycle of disaster self-induced disaster to generate odd jobs here and there <laughs> yeah. and then just keep people on the wheel and that's mm -hmm. why i'm saying our energy is being harvested in that uh -huh. we are we are being farmed for our energetic pattern so that's why it's so important not to love money uh -huh. you, you see money as like a utilitarian thing but you don't do what you're doing for money uh -huh. you do what you're doing because you have a passion and joy for life. And you always understand that you're provided for by only one thing. There's only one provider. Uh -huh. Your boss isn't the provider, the stock market, the fucking RPX, all that. All of that's just noise. Yeah. There's only one signal, and mm -hmm. that signal is from the creator. And so you tap into that and you just enjoy life you enjoy what god gave you specifically yeah because the way you're designed is specific no one mm -hmm. else is designed mm -hmm. like you so you dive into exactly what floats your boat and what gives you sustenance and then from that space your needs are going to be met no matter what well, that's the thing. I think the people who, who chase money the most are genuinely the most miserable because they don't have that. The reason that they're chasing the money is to try and find an answer or try and find an outlet or, or something that, that fulfills them. Um, whereas if, if you've already got that, then the money, yeah, it's, it, obviously it's always nice to have a bit more money or a bit more security or whatever, but it's not important to you. It's not, it doesn't govern your life. You know, it's it's the important thing is you, you're you're fulfilled, you're happy, you you know you you've got your family around you, and, and you know all all those kind of things. 
Whereas mm. the ones who are chasing the money, that you know, the, the the stock market people and all these, you know, where they're living on their own at 50 and, you know, they're drinking themselves to death and snorting coke every weekend. They're not, the, the, the money is irrelevant. Do you know what I mean, they, they, they may as well not have that money because they don't, they can't enjoy it. They can't, they don't know what to do with it. And it's, and it's actually making their, their life worse. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just go through these a quick bit. Um, Jonah Bear says, how gay is it to squirt inside yourself? <laughs> oh, that's so funny. I love that nickname. It's so funny. <laughs> no, what what's gayer? To squirt inside yourself or or be so energetically in tune that you don't even need to squirt inside of yourself? I suppose it depends what dimension you're squirting in as well, because there could be there could be all sorts of dimensions that we're squirting in every day, and we have no Dude, idea. About. You just blew my mind, mind blown. <laughs> what? Look at these. Um... <laughs> the chat's funny. Gay inception. Just squirt inside yourself. <laughs> right, I'm going to get on to these questions from Ukrainian because he sent a couple before, but I'll just got to open this because he he sent them on Instagram. So it was one sec. Um, now my phone's in the way. Right, he said, so this is from Ukrainian Bear. He said, have you ever looked into Soviet Union athletes and their health practice? Yeah, my, uh, I only did kettlebells for like two years and my teacher was from Russia. Right. And he, he had a strength first school. I forget what happened to him. I think he got caught doing something. Uh-huh. Or maybe he was laundering money. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but he, he always talked about the, the Russian training stuff. And when I was growing up in the 80s, you know, the Russians just kicked our ass in gymnastics. And that was the only thing I really liked watching in the Olympics was I really liked watching all the gymnast routines. And, like, the dude, they were, like, out of this world. And so I studied I studied anatomy and physiology and biology a bunch and um they had figured out this system back back in the 70s of a way of stretching that released the golgi reflex tendon in your muscles and so they really focused on stressing the insertion of of a let's just say an insertion of a ligament Uh they would put that under stress until it was about to fail. Right. And then they would, I guess, through breath work, really breathe into it. And they would hold a stretch for an hour if it took an hour. And then the Golgi reflex tendon would, would let go. And then that now the range of motion of that tendon or that, that ligament was yeah. now fully at 100%. Uh-huh. And they did that with all of their athletes. Right, and so there was all these stories of how their athletes would sit in these circles. It didn't matter if you were a gymnast or a wrestler or a pole vaulter or whatever, where they would sit there. And some days, like they would just stretch for like eight hours. Right, and you know, I grew up. up I grew up very duck footed. I had I had this. Uh, it was like almost a deformation where my my heels were like almost knocking on each other when I walked and I had like really terrible duck feet. And so I was told as a little little kid, um, my parents were told that we need to break your son's legs and reset his legs to get him to, to walk right. And my parents, thank God, were like, well, isn't there something else we can do other than, than like snapping his legs in half? And they're like, yeah. They're like, oh yeah, if he stretches every day for an hour, then then um, and he does these specific stretches, this yeah. will correct itself. Right. Well, that worked out pretty good for me. I was a scholarship athlete and a mm-hmm. pro athlete, and it was just like at a very young age, I always had my stretches I had to do. Mm-hmm. And I noticed by the time I got to high school, I spent more time stretching mm-hmm. and more time doing calisthenics and plyometrics than I did my actual sport that I was in. And then uh-huh. that parlayed into my my yoga life. Uh-huh. So like when I started to get into yoga, I was just a natural for it because I was like, oh, I understand this release mechanism uh-huh. of the of the Golgi reflex tendon. So 
that's about the extent of my uh, my knowledge of how the Russians went about things, at least in the 80s and 90s. Right. I mean, with with yoga, obviously you've got the physical release of, of stuff, but how, how do you, you know, the, the kind of the mental benefits as well? Is that is that purely through the release of, of the stress, or, or, or is, there, is there something more to it, do you think? I think for the Western mind, yoga, at least for me, was very beneficial because I'm a very muscle-bound, stocky dude. Uh -huh. So for somebody like, like me, I need to stretch to lengthen mm -hmm. my muscle groupings, my ligaments, my tendons, and things like that. Uh -huh. I was in classes, though, of nothing but women. Uh -huh. So there was that benefit of being around lots of cute girls, <laughs> especially in my 20s. I was mm -hmm. like, hey, this is great. I'm going to become a yoga instructor. <laughs> Woo but it all depends on the body type. Mm -hmm. For like a ballerina or like my wife who's hyper flexy, yoga's not mm -hmm. really, yeah. that's not going to be beneficial to her. She should weight mm -hmm. lift. Mm -hmm. And in weight lifting and gaining strength, because it, there's this weird irony. Because I, I had been around enough of, like, supreme athletes uh -huh. to see, like, these, like, super fit, like, vascularity, 5% body fat guys uh -huh. that hardly ate anything, uh -huh. never stretched, but were super flexible. Yeah. But the one thing that they all had in common was they had incredible strength. Uh -huh. And this gets Back to my my Russian trainer in in kettlebells, his, his whole thing was like, once the muscle reaches its pinnacle in strength, in, uh -huh. in balanced strength, it will find its equilibrium in its range of motion. Right. And I tend to believe that. Uh -huh. I think it's, that makes sense. it's not. I think it's not just stretching. I think it's a combination of being both flexible and strong. Uh -huh. Like in each one of our bodies are different yeah. we have different levers yeah. so like there's certain schools of yoga that are really good for certain body types mm -hmm. and certain types that are terrible like i'm a mesomorphic guy with a really long torso i was mm -hmm. like the worst ashtanga yogi you'd ever seen but you put me in a hot yoga class where we're doing nothing but like kriya yoga mm -hmm. and i was like the man mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. like you know, there's like a thousand ways to skin a cat. Like, there's all these different ways of going about it. It sounds very similar to, to kind of myself and my wife because I'm I'm like ninety percent torso. My legs are tiny. I'm like, I'm just like I look ridiculous. Um, and my wife is like very naturally just slim. Never like does any exercise. Just does absolutely nothing. But whenever we've like we've tried yoga a few times and, and stuff together. Um, and she can just she can move and she's very flexible and she can do whatever and and she's never she she she'll never go for a run she'll never do any kind of exercise at all can eat anything and it's just like perfect body size whereas if I like eat something wrong I'll put on like thirty pounds <laughs> do you know what I mean and yeah. then not be able to move for three weeks yeah so when when I do yoga I do get something from it I do get like like genuine thing. And she's, yes. she said, like, I get nothing from it. I don't see the point. Like, I get yeah. absolutely nothing from it. So the strength thing makes sense. Like, I'll, I'll have a word with it about it. Like, cause it, it so it's almost like, like the the opposite of what your body naturally is. So then that's, like, the, the balance. Right. I can only listen to him in, like, 10-minute yeah. ten minutes spurts. Because uh -huh. he's only said – he says the same thing mm -hmm. all the time. And I respect him, but I don't necessarily believe his ideology. Uh -huh. um, I came from that world that he's in right now. Like I understand the the Vedanta Advaita. Um, I under I understand all of his UN conditioning. Mm -hmm. That's that's just the best way I can put it. And I don't agree with it, so I don't really need to listen to it. <laughs> um. Right, we've got another squirt inside yourself reference from you. So he says, do you think your bear name will always be Mr. Squirt Inside Himself Bear? Or will your other qualities ever overshadow it? <laughs> I, think, I think you're stuck with that now. I think that's, that is your bear name. <laughs> well, I'm always asking out. I'm like, dude, what am I? Am I a domesteading bear? Am I like, you know, it, he doesn't know. He just calls me gardener. So, um, 
most people I know in the community just call me Topher or Gardner. Mm -hmm. I, I don't really care. Yeah. It, it, I think it's, it's really funny. I find mm -hmm. it hilarious. So if I hear it, I'm just going to laugh. Um, right. He says, what is your favorite and least favorite part about – well, hang on. There's a, there's a question before that. Uh, what's the transition to Missouri been like for you and your family? It's been great. The environment here is pretty ideal for my body. My wife um, would prefer to be closer to a coast. Right. <laughs> you know, she's a mermaid, so she she likes being near near the salty water. So we have a nice compromise here because we're on a freshwater lake. Right. Uh, the people the people here have been awesome. Like we mm -hmm. wouldn't be here unless the people were here. And mm -hmm. so I'm. I met Mr. Permi Bear and his wife, and they invited us up, and we were instantly like simpatico. And you know, they met a bunch of other bears, and then went to the festival, and it was just like, dude, this place is like this rocks, mm -hmm. and um, it's it's not highly like it it fits all the different uh, characteristics of an area that I think will feel the upcoming changes very well. Uh, Chris has just put in the chat, there is a nice arch in Missouri. I was going to ask you about that. Do, do you think that's anything more than just a nice piece of architecture? Oh, my God, yes. Because what did they used to say? They used to say it was the gateway to the West. Mm -hmm. And then what is the other lore like whenever they say gateway like the gateway bridge all these things mm -hmm. they, that's encoding something there's a um, so the west you know the the mythos that the american mythos that we're being given is manifest destiny your future is west my son mm -hmm. and so here st louis has the the arch that's the gateway to the west mm -hmm. there is definitely some serious um energetics going on with that do you think it's linked with the river as well or yes because it, it's i'm pretty convinced that the mississippi is the real nile mm -hmm. um i've done a couple podcasts with the archivist on on youtube and between my mormon friends between the archivist and all of his work with uncovering all of this all these these old newspapers from the late 1800s, early 1900s, all the stuff that was wiped yeah. through the Prussian school system. You know, when they were, you know, putting pylons in the Mississippi to put, you know, different bridges and stuff across, they were hitting stone structures in the bottom of the Mississippi River that they could not get to. Right. Yeah, so I really think what we're told because the mississippi river it has the word isis in it twice the god right. and the mm -hmm. god isis so come on guys let's let's be real and plus <laughs> my my mentor in geopolymers he was adamant the reason why the, the zari hawass wouldn't let him back in egypt was because mm -hmm. he fucking completely blew up the narrative of the pyramids in the late 70s mm. he showed that they were geopolymers and that you could recreate them easily and they weren't nearly as old as people said they uh -huh. were. so my feeling is is that there was a cataclysm in north america because remember everything's inverted in history so they they call uh, north america the new world bullshit it was the old uh -huh. world and there was a cataclysm that forced everybody to the east and uh -huh. then as the 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 climate got back to being what it needed to be people then migrated mm -hmm. back west again mm -hmm. so so that's mm -hmm. my feeling of it no it makes sense makes sense um i was gonna ask you something i can't remember what it was yeah i can't remember what it was i'll come back to it um give us one second let me just load this thing up again um and his final question is, do you have any insights into the Michael Orr situation or any thoughts on it? Who's that? You know, the, the, the footballer who they made the blind side about the, the movie. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Oh, wait, with Sandra Bullock? Yeah. What, I well, mean, the, what's, the, what's the deal with him? Like, from I don't the know little I know. 
Yeah, the the little I know the because it was based on a real story, um, and it, there's there's some split between him and the family who like took him in, um, and it's uh, as far as I can see, it's it's something to do with like money being owed and and all this. They've had this like huge row, but I I don't know. So yeah, yeah, I have, I have no clue. I, I I was a scout when he was coming up, and so I um, really I thought he was a. a a decent football player, but I didn't know any of his backstory. Right. Have you seen the movie though? No. It's all right. It's a, given that it's a Sandra Bullock film, and it's but it's it's not it's not a bad movie. Um, it's I definitely I definitely give it a watch. Mm -hmm. Um, right. Van Dutch says, does Tofa have thoughts on the Yellowstone super volcano being the the being the catastrophe? Well, I think they like to supercharge it with the intent of exploding it mm. <laughs> you know th whoever the the parasites are at the top they really have a bug up their ass about the western north america like mm. you look at the abuse from like let's just, just say the midline of the united states from like say the middle of texas going up through oklahoma mm -hmm. up through the dakotas and to the west to the rocky mountains that mm -hmm. area has been has gotten the shit kicked out of it mm. and then you, you go down and through nevada and stuff like that like my the the level of abuse that's been consistently given to that area of the world is mm. is unbelievable when you when we were talking before about the the, the kind of america being the old world and then they did whatever and then everyone went east do you think it was th those people went east, or do you think it was like those those people are now dead? We re we start again with people from the east. Do you know what I mean? So like each time there's there's something we do. The, the, so it's, let's say it happened again. Is everyone in America or, or everyone in the West basically doomed, and then we start again with China and and all the Chinese no, people? No, no, it's, it's never everyone. It's never mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. That's a that that in and of itself, I think, has been propagated mm -hmm. as a as a mind virus. Mm -hmm. You always, always it's life. I think it look, works much more on a bell curve where you always have outliers on either side of the curve. Right. So, so the outliers on either side of the curve do not experience what the mean populace experiences. Right. Okay. Um. Right, two acres says, what do you think earthquake and volcanoes may be if we're assuming mainstream model is wrong? If, if we're assuming that the mainstream model is wrong, I think a lot of the volcanoes are stumps of trees, of, mm -hmm. like, of mega trees that got hit by the last plasma storm. So I'm of the opinion, like, um, I've talked, I'm, I'm going to have Jason Brashears on my podcast. Mm -hmm. I've only talked. I've only talked to him once, but I've listened to a bunch of his work where he talks about the vapor canopy. I'm not necessarily a vapor canopy person. I think what we would experience that would be similar to a vapor canopy would be these massive trees that mm -hmm. had these huge canopies. And where I lived in Costa Rica, there were seven. There were seven. Um, Matt, like, well, there are three active, but seven volcanoes within a 150-mile vein of the Talamanca right. mountain range there. Mm -hmm. And I had this moment where I was standing near the Arnal volcano looking south, and I could mm -hmm. see the two volcanoes in Isla de Ometepe in the Nicaragua lake. Right. And then there were there's two other volcanoes near Biagua, uh, and I was standing on the fifth. So I was literally, and if I pan to the north, I can uh -huh. see Poat. Right. So in my line of sight, I had seven volcanoes, and it was one of those like mind stopping yeah. moments because I was like, oh, th this was the rainforest. Uh -huh. And so now that, now that um, the plasma physics is catching up, mm -hmm. you know, like I've been studying uh, David LaPointe 
since 2013. And since 2012, he's had a working model of uh, what you would call um, low potential, high yield plasma. And so he shows that through magnetic and uh, through plasma pressure gradients, you can create discharges that are kajillions of volts over unity. Right. <laughs> and so I think what happened at one time with the work of Mike Wilkerson is that one of the things that explains petrification so well is that mm -hmm. when you hit certain biological organisms with very, very, very strong plasma, they will mm -hmm. instantly petrify. Yeah. And so you can have organs petrify, you can have mm -hmm. other things petrify. So imagine that you had a tree that was like, say, a hundred times the scale of what was an avatar. Mm -hmm. Imagine mm -hmm. the lightning storm that would come in and strike that tree. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's unfathomable mm -hmm. amount of power. Mm -hmm. It hits a tree like that size and like explodes it, parts of it the tree are flying everywhere. Animals are flying everywhere. Everything that was in that tree are going everywhere. Mm -hmm. But now the mass that was in the ground is now under a smolder burn. Uh -huh. And so, then, and so this would make, then you would end up having these things called lava. Because the thing about studying magnetics, a lot of people don't know, is um, magnets are heat permissive. So that means, like, if you put a magnetic field around heat, the magnetic field goes away. Uh -huh. So the model that we are given of the Earth of having liquid hot magma in a magnetosphere, that's impossible. Uh -huh. So obviously the lava that we're seeing is the lava is a, a pyroclast of something uh -huh. that has a lot, a lot of metals in it. It, it's mainly magnetite, it's mainly iron oxide. And so and you also have a lot of aluminum oxide. So to me, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my God, like these volcanoes were probably cauldrons from mm -hmm. the last great plasma storm. And would it last that long? Do you mean, would it, on, on the, would it be simmering for, for that long from, from whenever the plasma storm was? So I, I have a theory. <laughs> So I think things, when you're in like the Satya Yoga, the, the golden age, and uh -huh. the scale of everything's much larger, like humans or giants or titans and like trees or like home tree uh -huh. and like all that, what a uh, hundred years of our time is like, you know, a month of their time. You know what I'm saying? So to the scale of let's say let's just say for shits and giggles that I, my my hypothesis of these being uh remnants of plasma cauldrons uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> those cauldrons imagine a tree that size if that happened a couple thousand years ago in our time to it that was like yesterday yeah whenever when time is like the my, my one thing that i can't get my head around that's like the just when we when it goes other than kind of what we know to then think of like other other kind of ways of looking at time and stuff i can never i can never like yeah i can never grasp it yeah so if if we're going with the giant trees and, and stuff like that do you think everything was to scale or do you think like Yes. It, yeah, you think it, you think it was. Yeah, and I think consciousness is the scale. In that case, then, do you think that the land was bigger? Because obviously, yes. if it, yeah. So maybe it was fenced off after all this happened. I think we literally can only see as far as our consciousness will let us. Right. Because the boundary between us and the metaphysical realm is our consciousness. That's uh -huh. why I. That's why I am a huge proponent of, I call it celestic profiling. Other people mm -hmm. call it astrology. But the best way to look at it is <clears throat> the very perimeter of what we see is the boundary layer between the physical and the metaphysical. We call it stars. We call it, you know, stellar things. Mm -hmm. But for all, 
all intents and purposes, we really don't know what it is. We just know we're experiencing a phenomenon. Yeah. And that phenomenon is kind of reflecting back to us through the law of correspondence what we actually are relative to mm -hmm. it. So, so um, it's very, very important. Like you can know a lot about a house or a manor by the fence that's around it. <laughs> and that's the way that's that's the way I see the stars. That's the way mm -hmm. I see the luminaries. Is I see the luminaries as the perimeter fence of our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think this scale in the past was much, much larger. Mm -hmm. In the Satya Yuga, like in the Golden Age, I think it was like it's exactly what they talked about in the Brahmayana and the in the Puranas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just. I mean, if if it was to scale, then the the sky would have to be to scale as well, presumably, because otherwise it wouldn't really make sense. So, would do you think the stars have always been there in, in those positions, or do you think? No, I don't know. What, I know what you're saying with it being a consciousness thing, but did you? Almost like a like a great reset. Do you, do you know what I mean when when it was scaled down or, or whatever? Do you think the sky Sky changed as well. I think the sky changes, yes. Right. Uh, just let me go through these. Um, right, VJS says, how could current life live under giant trees? Falling branches would land like bombs, making Earth uninhabitable. Yeah, current life doesn't live under giant trees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's an easy answer. <laughs> um, right, Joe, um, these are a few questions that we ask everyone who comes on. Um, so, what is your favorite movie? If you have to, I know it's a hard question, but if you have to pick one. Oh, man. Can't even give me a genre. Shit. Well, all right. If you're. Because we have two questions, so it's, it's a favorite movie and then your favorite kind of guilty pleasure movie. So if you're feeling rotten and you, you've, you, your wife's brought you a bowl of soup, what movie's going to cheer you up? Either Godzilla or, or Kill Bill. Uh, okay. Those are two guilty, those are two guilty pleasures that my wife can't stand, but I love. <laughs> and I... And, I have to admit, I haven't seen the, the last two John Wick movies, but I'm really looking forward to when I can. Right. What, which Godzilla, the, like the, the recent-ish one, or like are you going back to the I actually, my, my favorite Godzilla movie, because my daughter, I've gotten her addicted to Godzilla right. too. She really right. likes Godzilla vs. King Kong, because right. she likes... She likes big furry animals. So we watch Godzilla vs. King Kong. And I, I tend to like that one, because there's... You know, they get kind of gay with some of the other Godzilla movies with too much, you know, plot lines. And, uh, no, I want to see... All that filmmaking nonsense. I want to I see Titans, because <laughs> I, I love scale. You know, I, I love the scale of, like, when they show him swimming and he makes, like, an aircraft carrier look to me. I just, I love that. Like, that, that to me is just so cool. All right, would well, you... I think there's a possibility that we once had Godzillas, uh, yeah. you know, on, on your giant earth. Yeah. yeah, have you checked out Stellium 7 on YouTube yet? No. Yeah, check out Stellium 7, right. seven uh, Mike Wilkerson, he does all the instant petrification and he mm -hmm. spelunked into a mountain in Spain that looked exactly like an elephant. Oh, oh yeah. They actually call it an elephant, mm -hmm. and he went in through the ear, and like what, what he what looked like an ear on the mountain, and when they went into it, it was the exact anatomy of an elephant's ear, and this thing was just three miles long. Yeah. <laughs> I see. I, I think I've seen them. Well, I've seen an elephant mountain, so I'm assuming it's the same one. Um, well, do you think there was, there was a lot of it? Because obviously, it's it's hard to get your head around where you, you've got like giant trees taking up the side, the, the room of so many trees and stuff like that. So there were, do you think there was giant versions of a lot of things? Do you, mean, or, yeah. or do, you, do you think there was just less animals? I think it 
it was like similar but different. Yeah. I think you had huge humanoids. I think you had huge animals. You had huge flora and fauna. Mm -hmm. There were, and the scale was just so much larger because the consciousness was larger. Yeah. And when, how far in the past would you say this is? I mean, obviously, we, you know, time, so time, times that are nothing. But if you if you could put your finger on it, what? Well, I mean, you're talking like hundreds of years, thousands of years. No, I think it, it's like close to the Hebrew calendar. I think it was like six thousand years ago when the right. last real, when the real big cataclysm. Right. Yeah, so like what, the, the, the Hebrew calendar I think is at like five thousand nine hundred and eighty-one years or something. And when it finishes at six thousand. Yeah, the, that's that's yeah. what they say. That's what they claim. I'm sure we'll we'll definitely be finding out <laughs> soon. Yeah. Um, Samoa says you you're going to the festival, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How is the um, have you been working on the, the, the sort of the prepping of the festival and stuff? Well, the two times I went there, my wife was shooting a commercial, so I was on child duty. Right. So, so I'm going on on this Saturday, and I'm going to be weed whipping. Oh, okay. Cool. How far is yeah. it from where you are? I mean, is it is it a uh, it's like 35, 40 minutes. It's not that far at all. Okay, that's good. So are you staying over or are you, are you going home every night? No, I'm going home. No, I've, mm -hmm. I've been at so many festivals. I've, I've done so many festivals. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm at that stage of my life where, like, I really like people in short stints. Yeah. <laughs> no, if, I, if I live 25 minutes away, I'd be going home as well. Uh, the, yeah. It's just something, there's something about home versus a tent. So yeah. yeah. Um, Moon just says I've seen some dates that puts the year six thousand next April. Yeah, there's a couple, couple of Christian guys that I follow online. I, I think it's the Awake Souls channel, and I really like their calendrics. I really love their model of of of, of you know the realm that we're in. Mm -hmm. I don't know if the calendrics are right i've read so many books on calendrics where i'm like pretty convinced everybody's just kind of guessing <laughs> and i've been a student of astrology for over 20 years and just seeing the utter buffoonery around um people's lack of knowledge of like what's actually in the sky mm. you know because this the, the sky is the clock you know yeah. crow triple seven said it perfectly but most people haven't tuned their eyes to actually know what the clock is saying. Mm. So, so, you know, like I hear all these people talking about we're going into the age of Aquarius and this, that, and the other. And I'm like, yeah, I'm like 200 and something years. Because like if, if you're going to say the age changes when on the spring equinox, the sun, you know, divert south mm -hmm. into the next sign. That's going to be a minute. That's going to be way after we're all gone. Yeah. And so I do know enough, like when you're in the last degrees of any house, mm -hmm. when you're looking at somebody's chart, mm -hmm. they will start to take on attributes of the next sign. So if somebody is mm -hmm. like, you know, in degree 26 through say 30 of a sign, they're mm -hmm. going to start like say in Aries, they're going to actually start to show signs of Taurus. So mm -hmm. we're getting like the, these little hints yeah. uh -huh. of Aquarius now, but the truth of the matter is we're in the 11th house of Pisces, uh -huh. and the 11th house is ruled by Aquarius. Right. So people inadvertently say, oh, age of Aquarius, when they don't actually know what they're talking about. It's actually, we're in the age of Pisces. It's very uh -huh. obvious we're in the age of Pisces. But the Aquarian undertones are making their way mm -hmm. felt right now and then we're going to go through like 180 years to 200 years of like being in the 12th house of pisces and that's going to be just dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be like where all the subconscious stuff that's been you know you know pushed under through plutonian forces is going to be brought up and that's one when people are really going to feel like, you know, the world's gone to hell in the handbasket. 
And then once you get through that and you actually enter the new age and then you're in the first house of the Aquarian age, uh-huh. then there will be this respite and this breath of, of, of fresh air. Uh-huh. So, um, yeah, like there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of karma that needs to be worked through over the next few hundred years. As far as like the, the the astrology goes, do you think that was worked out by by man, or do you think it was kind of given to us as, as almost like a manual for for how how no. for how it happens? God, if you ask, God provides. Mm-hmm. And our for our forebears knew that what they were looking at, they actually called it the heavens. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so they would look to God. They, God's in heaven. I'm going to look to the heavens to know, to, to see. Uh-huh. And they, they live longer lifetimes. So for them to look at this night sky for 100 years wasn't a big deal. Yeah, true. You know what I'm saying? They weren't watching, you know, reruns of The Office. <laughs> <laughs> they, they were looking at the night sky. They were looking at God in heaven. They knew that they that was the boundary between them in the in the, the metaphysical realm and they just mapped it we didn't make it uh-huh. we use language to describe it but that doesn't mean we made it yeah i mean it's all it, i've always wondered that whether it's um because it we it seems to have been around for a long time but it, it's the same old thing where we always think people in the past were simpletons who didn't know anything and we're we're the only people who know the you know how to work things out but yet we've had all these charts and calendars and stuff for as long as records exist right so you know like i say was it like a like a manual that was given to the first people or is it something that we've we've worked out because i think the um when we were saying before when you were saying before about the mississippi and stuff with the the getting rid of this information well, with the internet, especially, it's so easy for them to just get rid of information, you know, because no one's going to a library anymore and going through old news reports and, and old books and checking things out. It is just a Google search, and so you could, you can, you you you're very easily just dumbing down the world. Basically, you 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 you're taking all the information and giving snippets, and that's it. Because no no one does a Google search and even goes to page three. Do you know what I mean? So they're not going to go down to the yeah. library and put little white gloves on and go through a book for three days to try and find information. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, uh, let's just say the uh, the uh, ruler of this realm at the moment, mm-hmm. meaning the lower ruler, not yeah. like the ruler, yeah. but the lower ruler, I think figure out about 120 130 years ago hmm i'm gonna kill them with convenience because uh-huh. it's the easiest thing to do you get something in the comfort trap you know I, i'll have people message me about my podcast right they'd be mm-hmm. like oh my, oh my god your podcast has changed the gravy you ladle Ugh. they're like where can i do this i'm like well just go to my website Go to the website and, you know, you go to the website and on the website, you can scroll down the page and every podcast is on the page. Uh-huh. And it's like, that's like grail to them. <laughs> like, like I, I, I'm just, I feel very fortunate because I moved to the jungle when smartphones came out. Right. So I didn't get the initial blast of convenience mm-hmm. that has literally retarded people to the nth degree. Like, no, I, had not, to, no. Go on. <laughs> I had to wait seven or eight years to get retarded. <laughs> but even <laughs> at that, even at that, my internet was so bad, and I, I consistently moved to areas where my internet is horrible. So it's not like mm-hmm. I have, like, my upload speed at my house is, like, half a meg. Like, it's mm-hmm. so slow here. But you know, you know what? I'm grateful for it because mm-hmm. it actually gives me time to read shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I think that, like, kind of our generation and, and maybe, like, I don't know, 
up until like the last 20-ish years, if, if we needed to know something, you, you either had to work it out yourself or you had to go and read, a, you know, when you, when you were a kid or, or, or whatever, when you were younger. You had to go and find it out. You had to go and seek that information. And the, the skills that you then use to do that, so, you know, you, you then have to go and write, well, where's, where's the best information to get it? How do I decipher where, you know, which bit's right, which bit's wrong? How do I discern it? And how do I then put this into, like, what I need to, to know? So you're doing all these kind of research skills, which you don't realize you're doing. Whereas mm -hmm. now you're just asking Google for an answer. And so you never have to think about anything for a second. You just get in an instant answer, and it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. Hang on. Oh, I've got you back. Yeah, so you're just getting this instant answer now. Whether it's right or wrong doesn't matter. It's just that I've, I've got an answer. And no one questions mm -hmm. that. Whereas I think, like I say, if, you, if you've been used to trying to work things out yourself, you then question that answer. Because you've already kind of been thinking about it a little bit as you as you type in the Google search. So I think the next generations, if they don't keep hold of those skills or they're not taught those skills, they're going to be so easy to manipulate. You know, to way easier than than they are at the moment. Because it'll just be, you know, this is what you do, and no one will ever question it. What people should look into is the term operant conditioning. Right. What's that? Briefly. It's where you, you react, you don't think. Right, okay. You react to its stimulus. Mm -hmm. And so the whole hundred, last hundred years in North America has been to switch people from the capacity to think through a problem mm -hmm. into just reacting to a stimulus. Mm -hmm. Which has now resulted in Google, which <laughs> which is that's it. And wait, yeah. wait, that's even going to get pared down even more with people all into like, oh, AI, mm -hmm. AI, AI. You can just see, see uh, what they're doing with that. Like they're building the mythos of this AI being so smart and so grand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we fact checks like. Uh, I have scientist friends of mine that like we're building devices, like we're doing experiments, and we we have like real world data and books and the whole thing. And we'll ask Chat GPT something, it fucking doesn't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes shit up. Yeah. It takes an aggregate, probably of like the top ten pages mm -hmm. of Google, and just collates it. Well, the majority of the time, um, whenever I search something on Google, I never get the answer. And I'm not searching, like, the meaning of life and so on. So I'm searching, like, relatively simple things that the, the Internet should know. And you, you either get answers that are not related to your question whatsoever or the wrong answer because it'll, it'll link you to a post on Reddit or, or, or something. It'll be just complete gibberish um, or something on Quora or whatever it's called. Um, but a lot of the time, it, it, it will just give you results that have nothing to do with what you've asked. Or, mm -hmm. you know, so it's it's almost like it's getting worse, whereas it used to be quite a useful tool. Do you mean, like, you want to know something, like, well, okay, there it is. Same with, like, YouTube searches and all these things, they seem to be getting worse. Now, whether that's because people aren't in charge of these things anymore, that's just been handed over to AI. You know, yeah. A friend of mine, a friend of mine that works for Amazon, mm -hmm. like an, on a pretty high level, he says they can't control the AI. He mm -hmm. said they like within the programming circles that he's in, mm -hmm. and he tra travels all over the world for Amazon. Like mm -hmm. he's like he's an exec, you know. And he's like he's like yeah. A few months ago, we just made the decision that. Fuck it. We're just going to see what happens. <laughs> they literally don't know because it's running algorithms and it's running languages that they don't, they can't read. Right. And so well, they're like, okay. And they'll give it a command, just like you're saying, like, mm -hmm. oh, on Google, uh, show me, you know, the best Godzilla movies ever. And then next thing you know, they're showing you Barbie or whatever. Like it's showing you what it wants you to see. Mm -hmm. 
that, that's exactly right. And it's, I, I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing because obviously I, I, you don't want the world to go into like an AI controlled world. So it's kind of good that it doesn't work. But at the same time, if they're pushing this as like the answer, they, well, it's, it's going to make everything worse, really. I mean, because it's it's obviously not the answer. So the second that they have, start, have zero fear. Company. Have zero fear. Mm -hmm. Corruption is always incompetent. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. it's it's proven with the, the the likes of the self-driving car and all this. They don't work, you know. So they no. they can't. You can't have them, you know. So no. <laughs> until they, until they work, which I don't think they ever will, because there's so many variables. And I think that's why the likes of Google doesn't work on AI because people want to know so many different things and will ask certain ways. And it, it's not we're not machines, you know. We're mm -hmm. not. We don't work on these like set prompts and commands. We're, we're you know everyone's slightly different and, and comes at things from a slightly different angle. And I don't think AI will ever be able to cover it for us all. Postal Fed says we need a low-tech internet. Well, that, that's the thing. It, it, it used to be like that, didn't it? It used to be relatively simple, but it was very useful. Uh, uh, let me scroll through. Right, just what we got a sec. If anyone's got any like last questions, uh, just stick them in the question marky bubble. Cause I, I don't want to keep you too long. I don't want to. I know you've already done a, a stream this morning, so. Uh, yeah, a library. I, I don't know. Are they still a thing, libraries? They, they can't be long for this world. They, they, they'll have to go soon. Because what? There, there has to be actual book burning. If you've got libraries that you then get rid of, where are the, where are these books going? You know, they're, they're not just your, your local library. They have to. They would make it biochar. <laughs> <laughs> um. Just have a look through. Um, right, Postal Fest, are you, so, are you selling dome, how, dome home plans? No, the only plans, I mean, I sell those to people that I'm building homes for. I don't just sell dome home plans. I, uh, I'm i a big proponent of knowing the land. Where, where, whatever house I'm designing for somebody, I need to go site survey it and consult to make sure that all the the attributes of the land are honored in the building mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm very selective with who i build for right so it's not just an out the box thing you've used kind of no uh cucumber says is biochar easy to create even in wisconsin especially in wisconsin yes right okay um I hate the questions on on Instagram because it'll uh, it'll alert you that there's a question, but it's kept all the other questions and now they're just in a different order. <laughs> so you, it doesn't say like this is the last question. So you've got to go through them all again and try and find yeah. which one you're on now. Uh, Moon Jazz says, "Do you have any black hole sun gravy?" Yeah, they're portals. I think the black hole is analogous to the psychopath. I think the the reason why they popularized it through media was because they were trying to get people used to being around the parasite class. Of right. So I think the the parasite class is has like a non-human intelligence that's very psychopathic, and, and the black hole is the perfect analogy for that. Huh. On the on, on the physics level, it makes zero sense. <laughs> It is all built on Einsteinian, you know, relativity, you know, warped space time because mm -hmm. of mass displacement. All that's bullshit. What they're trying to tell you is there are entities that cannot consume enough. Right. There, there, are, there are entities that energetically literally devour everything that's around mm -hmm. them. Everything. And there's no, no light that's emitted from it. The light is gone from it. That's the analogy that they're making. No, yeah, no, I've never thought of it like that at all. Dan says uh, black holes marry their first cousins. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I mean, the again, the black hole thing kind of proves what happens when you lie, if you like, because you have to go to a ridiculous level to then justify your, your initial lie. So it starts off with a, you know, a, a little made up thing and then eventually you're on time bending black hole, all this kind of nonsense just to justify your your original little story that you made up. Mm -hmm. uh, um, right, Ian says, Archons, true or not? I always like to ask people like to define terms. Um, I understand, like, for the way I was conditioned in, in Gnosticism, Archons mm -hmm. are essentially demons, right. and demons are real. Mm -hmm. Like, that is that is a thing. There are mm -hmm. disincorporated or unincorporated beings that want to influence you in a very specific way to their ends, not to your end. So yeah, that that's a that's a real thing. Do you think they're real in a sense of? Do, do you think that, do you think it's a personal demon or do you think it's like a demon? Do you I think it, it can be both. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, actually, that was the very first thing that that BB quoted me on. Right. Um, because I was telling Mike Wilkerson when I was confronted with an arch demon, a mm -hmm. familial archdemon and then my guides my 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 uh protective angel behind me was like she told me she's like take a deep breath and she's like demons have no power they only have influence hmm. so you have to me a demon and an archon they don't have any power mm -hmm. they just have the ability to influence you to make a decision yeah but that that's not power uh -huh. power is power power means your free will is at <laughs> god has power uh -huh. like you could have the free will to disagree with god it does not fucking matter because god uh -huh. has power and you you are trumped uh -huh. <laughs> you you are pushed aside by the will of that which has power demons have have zero power. Mm -hmm. They work on you, on on your on your vice your vice body mm -hmm. to to get you through guilt or through shame or through whatever to move in a direction mm -hmm. through fear. So power is a completely different construct. But there are beings that you'll come across that have varying levels of power, mm -hmm. and they're usually completely incorporated beings right so i suppose that's why people who seem to be more demonic than others or whatever or more evil bad whatever than others it's just that they're listening to the the, the demons more than the normal person is so if we if we hear bad thought or, or you know bad advice or bad thoughts or whatever come into our head we just shut it out and move on Whereas right. if you listen to it and you, you, you're then acting upon that, then it kind of lets that energy in more. So it's then, a, you know, the, the more you listen to it, the more it's, it's going to give you. So that, yeah. that can make sense here. Um, just one sec. Right, Postal Fair, what, what knowledge or story would you want passed on to your grandchildren? It's a cool question. I think the mo most powerful story that is timeless is the story of the prodigal son. Hmm. And the reason Do you think that and why... Be from? What's that? No, I said, do you think that that is... Do you think it's going to be passed on to the extent that it has been so far? Or do you think it's, it's the trying to phase that out? Um... You know, there's so many different traditions that I've read that have their own version of it. It is the human story. Mm -hmm. So we have a father that has all, all the riches in the world. Mm -hmm. We say no. We say no. I'm defiant. I'm going to do it my, my way. <laughs> we, 
we experience the vice that we want to experience. We mm -hmm. experience things on our own terms. And then we come back with our tail tucked behind our leg in humility. Like uh -huh. this, I really think the physical realm is about being humble. Uh -huh. I think that's why like the first commandment or the second commandment is, you know, have no false idols. Uh -huh. It's like you make false idols, idols of your desires. You make false idols out of the things that you're trying to achieve. You make false idols out of false authorities all these things it's all temporary uh -huh. none of this shit is real uh -huh. none of it none, none of it's going to be around yeah. so the prodigal son story is awesome because it gives the contrast of the one that stayed right next to the father uh -huh. and he's fucking jealous he's so jealous because he's like dad how can you let johnny the dipshit who fucked up constantly and like spent his inheritance. Why are you so happy that he's coming back? Mm -hmm. Dude, that is the story of the devil <laughs> being right at the right hand of God saying, look, these humans, they are dumb. They're not as beautiful as us. They're not as powerful. Fuck, mm -hmm. they're mortal. They don't even fucking live that long. They fuck up constantly constantly they're stupid they're ugly they don't know shit they're forgetful they're they're full, full of vice they don't he's the accuser uh -huh. but i love the prodigal son story because like the father is just so happy uh -huh. it's like there's only one time and that time is now that time is zero he came back uh -huh. hey I gave him free will. You're gonna fuck up. To err is to be human, right? You're gonna fuck up. You're gonna mess up. You know what? I'm okay with that. At least he came back. Uh -huh. You, you dipshit. You didn't even <laughs> have the fucking balls to go fuck up. You've been sitting here kissing my ass the entire time, talking shit about your brother. You're worthless to me because you're not loyal. You have no mm -hmm. love in your heart. All you care about is your inheritance. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. dude, he doesn't even care if he gets his inheritance. He's just coming back because he's fucking humbled by life. I think that's the best story. If there's a story to be told and my, my grandkids are to know it, mm -hmm. I would hope that they would get that one. And I want, I want it told like that as well because it was told perfectly, I think. That's um, I think I think that's, that's a good thing about or, or the one of the points about loyalty. It's it's very it's very easy to be loyal when you have nothing else. So if you if you are just staying by your dad's side and say no, I'm loyal, I'm staying here, and you haven't been tested and, and anything like that, then I suppose you are loyal, but it's it doesn't mean anything. But whereas that's not you, you you understand that what that what the other son was what he was showing wasn't loyalty, uh -huh. real loyalty real love is you're happy when the being that you love or loyal to is yeah. happy uh -huh. if that, that if that brother if that second son was actually loyal to the father uh -huh. the second he saw the joy on his father's face he would have relinquished his position uh -huh. and not many people want to talk about that side of it uh -huh. but that's the truth uh -huh. when you truly love somebody it's a selfless thing yeah. and when you see them overjoyed you can't help but feel joy for them uh -huh. if yeah that would never feeling, if you're feeling jealousy in that moment yeah. you're a gamma you're you're yeah. you're a dipshit exactly and that, that's what i mean it's, it's easy to kind of claim loyalty by i don't know by default i suppose just by being there or, or whatever but it's if it's never tested, if it's never, you know, never given the opportunity to show it, then it, it doesn't mean anything. And like you said, if it, if it, if you then, it's not just about being there. It's about sometimes not being there. Is a, is the the true test, I suppose. I'm just trying to get this to work. Sorry. Um, my my friend, I'm gonna have to get rolling here. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, I, I will. Um, just give it one second. I'm just.
my phone's frozen a little bit. Here. Oh, sorry, I've got it back. I've got it back. It just spazzed out a little bit, <laughs> a little bit then. I know. I, I thought we would like. I thought we had questions, and then they stop, and then there's just more keep coming in. Um, yeah, and I've kept you for a while. So just jump back on in like a, a month or so, and then we'll, we'll pick up from where we where we leave off. Sounds great. Yeah, cool. Um, so most people here will be at the festival, so they'll all get a chance to ask you all the questions there anyway. <laughs> so yeah, I think you've got a busy few days coming up with people awesome. uh, just grilling you on things. But no, I, I really appreciate you coming on. Um, and I should, yeah, obviously I, I can't get to the festival this year. Hoping to in a couple of years on one because I'm in America in 2025. Um, so yeah, just, just hopefully I'll be at the festival then. But yeah, so for awesome. everyone who's going, have a great time. Um, if I don't speak to you before, and I'm, yeah, it's been really nice talking to you. Already. See and you my, guys. My mind is gravy now, so. <laughs> All right, cheers, buddy. Thank you. Um, right, everybody. Yes, my mind fully is gravy. Um, uh, yeah. I think I learned a lot then, so I hope you've all had a good time. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Gardner, for coming on. Just FYI for people, um, Wobbly is not around because obviously she's going to the festival. Um, so as far as replays go and, and stuff like that, there's going to be like maybe a week or two where we, we don't, we probably won't have uploads or anything on YouTube because um, she sorts all that out. So there's probably going to be a delay in, in uploads. We'll still put them on Instagram, but just for YouTube and BitChute Ladle and all that, they, they won't be on there for a couple of weeks. Um, so yeah, anyone that I don't speak to before, have a great time at the festival. Um, Anyone who wants to be a nice person can subscribe to my new YouTube channel. Um, if you just click on my thing on Instagram, the link's on there. So if any of you are interested. Um, have a great weekend, everybody, and I shall see you next week. Coddington's on on Monday.